Okay, well, thanks everyone for coming, especially at this particular time of year. You can almost <coughs> smell the Easter eggs being opened, can't you? But um, I, I just wanted to, before we started, I wanted to let you all be aware that aspects of this lecture are being filmed. So if any of you have a, an objection to that, please let me know. And, and, uh, and yeah, we'll... I'm afraid that you'll have to leave, but um, <laughs> but it'll only be the back of your head, and and I'm sure um, you know it will be. It, it shouldn't be a problem. They'll be very, in, not very intrusive, hopefully. So, okay. So, so I'm going to talk to you today about the Frozen Ark project, um, which is a, a, a biobanking charity that I have become involved with, well actually I was involved with it um, from fairly early on as a trustee, um, but uh, in recent times for my sins I have become uh, interim director, that word interim becoming more and more tenuous as time goes on. Um, but So what I thought I would do today uh, is tell you a little bit about um, biobanking in perhaps a way you haven't thought about it before, because if you ask most people what biobanking is, they'll they think about uh, things like human um, uh, biobanks, which involve cancer tissues um, and other kinds of uh, human biobanking. They don't normally think too much about biobanking for non-model organisms, which is what uh, we're doing, um, and still less for endangered species, or even why you might want to do biobanking of that kind of material. Um, and I think a sort of a recurring theme that I'll probably talk about as I go through is the idea of, of, of trying to draw a line between the concept of preservation and conservation. So um, a lot of people's thoughts about biobanks, um, especially when it comes to non-model species, is that we're preserving things in aspic for the rest of time, in case there's a nuclear war or something. Um, whereas our um, approach to this kind of biobanking is very much more down the line of human biobanking, which is that this material has to be used. It's there for being to, to be used. It's there to contribute both to basic scientific research, but also to conservation uh, into the future. And I hope over the next 40 minutes or so that I can weave some kind of narrative to convince you that that, 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 um, that pathway is, is feasible. Um, you all know this, of course. Uh, we're currently experiencing an extinction pulse which is largely anthropogenic in nature, and which is um, a, a, an occurring at an unprecedented level, perhaps a hundredfold, possibly a thousandfold higher than the background rate of extinction. Um, and and as, as I just mentioned, the, the major difference between this particular extinction event and the ones that we've had in the past, the previous five um, that, that we know about, um, is that this is an anthropogenic, it's a single species causing it, and it's, it's us, of course, um, and everything from land use change, over-harvesting, pollution, uh, invasive species, and global warming, all of these things together acting as a per perfect storm, if you like, to um, both uh, marginalise, in some cases, fragment in many cases, and completely eradicate, in some cases, the biodiversity that we that we see around us, um, and that is a a problem that we've known about for a while. Um, and while some of the public discourse around it is a little bit contested, I think po most people realise if we don't do something very soon, uh, we will be losing big organisms. So, um, for example, people quite often have asked me, you know, when, but we haven't seen this massive re uh, extinction event on large mammals that, for example, we were predicting. So there has only been one recorded extinction event for a primate since 1950. Um, but we, there are many species that are in what we call extinction debt. So in other words, they haven't gone extinct yet, but it really seems very, very unlikely that they'll avoid extinction. A classic example uh, that's been in the news recently, I'm sure you're all aware, is northern white rhinoceros, uh, which is a subspecies, um, but, but which is down to two female individuals um, and, and a, a lot of sperm that's been collected um, and some very uncertain reproductive technology that may or may not be able to be applied to, to uh, rescue the population and give it a male effective population size of one. 
So really very difficult times in terms of, of conservation um, and particularly you know, the sort of narrative around how we get ourselves out of the situation has been traditionally very, uh, very difficult. Um, and people have accused us conservation biologists as, as moaners, effectively. Not re-moaners, moaners. Um, and, um, and there has been a, a big change, I think, in the, in the emphasis towards what's now known as optimi conservation optimism. So we're looking for uh, positive uh, narratives on how to get ourselves out of this. And I hope that this, the frozen arc is, could be a part of that sort of positive narrative. Um, the problem is that, that, as I'm sure you're all aware, that, that the timescales that we're dealing with um, in the Anthropocene are very, very short in comparison to the timescales that we uh, are normally used to thinking about when it comes to evolution, even population dynamics. So the changes are generally rather subtle, and so people can weave a narrative and say, basically, well, you know, um, the, the standard deviation f f around these, these mammalian counts over time are all overlapping. There's nothing really going on here, nothing to see here. Um, it doesn't stack up, though, when you start looking at, at, at certain groups of species with larger sample sizes and which are much more um, prone to, to, to um, environmental um, uh, degradation. Amphibians are the classic example, the kind of, for, in terms of vertebrates, the kind of um, uh, you know, a sentinel group that, that we can use because they absorb a lot of environmental um, contaminants through their skin, they depend on clean water, uh, and they are showing a really uh, important um, uh, uh, trend towards extinction. Um, and then there are some, some organisms which are extremely sensitive to temperature, for example, uh, water temperature, like corals, which are undergoing a decline which really, frankly, uh, beggars uh, belief. Uh, and if we're not you know, very, very careful very soon, um, uh, we will lose whole, whole ecosystem, coral ecosystems. So there is a, a, a reasonably uh, depressing narrative around uh, the way in which biodiversity is, is going at the moment. And it doesn't help when papers uh, in high-profile journals use terms like biological annihilation um, in their title. Um, it, while, and whilst it is, it, it's, it's sort of, um, I suppose it's... It, it, it's it, it's understandable that you would want to make the urgency of the situation uh, um, very, very clear. Um, it also sp spreads panic, and, and to some extent, I think sometimes some uh, a level of of um, paralysis in terms of what you can do. And, and and I think what we want to try and do to some extent is is accept and embrace that extinction is happening and may 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 happen at, at greater um, uh, velocities in it than, than we've experienced in the first, the latter part of the last century. But at the same time, say, but you know what, there are things that we can do to, to, um, to mitigate against this. And what, and it's just like ch climate change, while we can't probably avoid a, a 1%, uh, uh, sorry, one degree uh, change in, in global temperature, maybe we can avoid 3% and maybe that uh, will, will, will give us some, um, some, some greater benefits. So it's not all doom and gloom, um, and uh, you know, if there's a will, there tends to be a way in conservation biology. Uh, the classic example, perhaps, of this, and I've had some peripheral dealings with this, is the giant panda, um, which has recently been downlisted from endangered to vulnerable. Its, its population size is still uh, smaller than a relatively small village, so the global population of wild giant pandas is oscillating somewhere around 1,950 individuals. But it wasn't so long ago, the 1980s, when the population estimate was much lower than that, six to 800 individuals. Uh, and so very strong conservation efforts, um, very um, uh, strong uh, uh, conservation narrative and can, can help. And in the case of the giant panda, not only um, has the giant panda been saved, but many of the biodiversity uh, and threatened species that live in the same environment as a giant panda, which is an extremely unusual one, um, bamboo forest, um, have also been, been, been conserved. And if we focus only on numbers, there are species, even, even the, the Indian tiger um, and a number of other uh, species, we could say, have been pretty much turned around. There are some 
real issues around that though because we are continuing to lose genetic diversity within those species at a dramatic rate and, um, and that's something that I think that we need to be very careful about not being too obsessed on numbers um, and, and thinking a little bit more about the, the, the population dynamics and what we need to do to recover genetic diversity uh, in these uh, species. The role of ex situ conservation has really um, uh, developed substantially over the last uh, two decades, particularly. Um, Parchula snails, which were the, uh, the species, I'll come back to them because they really are the species that kicked off the, the frozen arc when it was originally established, um, are an example of a, of a group of species, um, snail species that exist in the South Pacific, um, that have been almost entirely dependent on captive breeding over the last several decades and would have certainly been extinct long ago had it not been for ex situ conservation. Um, there are other examples. There aren't a huge number of examples and I think the role of captive breeding is still something to be debated quite heavily within the conservation context. However, um, there, it's in unquestionably the case that, that there are some species that have been, um, that have been there's extinctions that have been prevented by captive breeding programs. Um, and uh, more and more now, there is an acknowledgement that biodiversity generally underpins a lot of uh, the ecosystem services and um, the, 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 the life systems that we depend on. Um, to the extent that, as you, some of you may be aware, that along with the intergovernmental platform um, on, on climate change, there's now an intergovernmental platform on biodiversity and ecosystem services, which is addressing the question um, of, of how much diversity and what kind of biodiversity that we need to stabilise ecosystems so that they can provide the goods and services that we need, along with all of the other species that exist. Biodiversity underpins a lot of the UN's sustainable uh, development goals um, and, uh, of course, is enshrined in, at a global level on, in this convention, the Convention on Biological Diversity that was first um, elaborated following the meeting at Rio de Janeiro in 1992, first elaborated in, in, in 1994 and continues to be uh, modified. The problem is that the targets that we set ourselves or have set ourselves in terms of biodiversity conservation through the convention um, have not been met at any stage, at any key point. So um, we had a, 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 we had supposedly come to the point where we were supposed to halt the loss of biodiversity by 2010 using a number of pretty well worked out measures. Um, the world generally failed, you know, abysmally in, in, um, in halting the loss of biodiversity by 2010. What do politicians do when that happens? Well, they set themselves a new set of targets 10 years into the distance that can be failed again, um, long after their particular governance cycle has come to an end. So we now have the 80 2020 targets. Um, we know that we're going to miss those. A midterm review that came out at the end of 2014 showed very clearly that we were going to miss them on, on every conceivable level. Um, and when that, the, the, the authorities, the IUCN, the CBD, are now come actively talking about uh, the 2030 targets, although they haven't been set yet. So we're going to be continuing to push back these targets, which we are we're trying to maintain, uh, it seems, on a decadal scale uh, at every point. Now, there are a number of possible um, solutions or explanations there, one of which is that those targets have always been completely unrealistic, uh, and we need to be a little bit more um, specific on what we're going for. And the other one is that we're not doing enough. And it's probably a combination of those two things. Um, in terms of genetics, uh, which is really the fundamental uh, sort of driver of the frozen arc, we do have a target which, is, um, uh, which, which, which appeared as if by magic, actually, um, after the, the Nagoya meeting in 2010. Um, and it really, for the first time, uh, alert, you know, alerted the world to the fact that genetic diversity is, is one of the three important layers of biodiversity and needs to be maintained. As many of these targets have been framed, it's framed very much from an anthropogenic perspective, so it starts off by cultivated plants and farms and domestic animals. Oh, and perhaps their wild relatives are important as well if they contain genes that are potentially useful in the future. And then other socioeconomically and culturally valuable species. And what we're supposed to do is maintain genetic diversity in these organisms, 
minimise genetic erosion, which is a really nebulous term. I, I won't talk too much about it, but it's, it's basically genetic alteration as opposed to simply loss and safeguard their diversity into the future. Um, and while this is a very anthrop anthropocentric view of genetic diversity, um, it, it, it's a fantastic start. So those of us who saw this when it, when it came out, we nearly fell off our chairs. We can work with this, even if, even if it is anthropocentric in its nature. Um, so, and what we can do is develop a set of common frameworks around this kind of um, definition of biodiversity. And one of the ways in which this is being implemented in practice is in conservation and threatened species is by implementation of something called the One Plan Approach. And the One Plan Approach to conservation really <coughs> is uh, resetting the paradigm in terms of how we um, uh, connect populations both in the wild and in museums, herbariums, botanic gardens, zoological collections, aquariums, those things, ex situ conservation. So in other words, we start thinking about the genes and the way they flow between insect situ and ex situ populations, the species which belong to them, uh, and the ecosystems in which they exist. And, and, and this is quite, you know, in the past, I think it's fair to say, the captive breeding programs and, and botanic gardens used to really operate in isolation from um, main conservation uh, programs in the wild. And indeed, a lot of people were very wary of, of, of investing and, and supporting ex situ conservation precisely because they thought it was totally irrelevant to what was happening in the wild. That's breaking down, and, and this, the, the one plan approach to conservation is really working. So, you know, if you go to a zoo or a botanic garden these days, most of the messaging you're going to get is, is really about what they're doing in natural environments, not so much what they're doing in, 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 uh, in their own um, uh, 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 sort of captive environment. And, and, but one of the things that really, me what matters now is that because of uh, the importance of both the genetic material and individuals in ex situ conservation as well as in situ, that the role of zoos and aquaria, and particularly biobank, in characterization of those populations becomes more, um, more relevant. Um, and biobanking is something that's really um, a relatively new development within the zoo context, but is actually gaining traction rather rapidly. So what are we talking about? Why are we interested in, in biobanking? Um, so effectively, the, it, there, are, there, are some, there are some sort of technological um, developments which are allowing biobanking to make a greater um, uh, uh, role, uh, play a greater role in, in the one plan approach. But there's also a, an increased recognition that we've got these highly um, anthropologically, uh, anthropocentrically um, changed, anthropogenically changed even, wild populations. So there's no such thing almost really as, an, uh, as a pristine wild population of any species. They've all been messed around one way or another, whether it's by invasive species, fragmentation, pollution, uh, anthropogenically mediated selection. Um, and then these captive populations, which are um, genetically managed as part of a captive breeding program. And they're both, in a sense, damaged goods. Pretty much everything we've got now is damaged goods in the wild. It's not pristine anymore. And so what we need to do is come out of this, this mindset which says wild equals pristine, captive equals uh, you know, um, somehow strange and weird and um, uh, uh, selective and, and etc. Um, but to think that actually what we're doing is fighting to maintain and manage the remaining demographic and genetic diversity that we have in both populations or in both, both, both systems. And that, can, uh, that involves so many different things nowadays. Obviously, it, 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 um, it, it involves um, harvesting, maintaining, and managing germline um, cells, um, uh, uh, and also um, uh, cell lines from fibroblasts, uh, and um, the creation of a potential resource for, um, for, for any kind of cellular um, uh, rescue that we can possibly imagine. Reproductive technology, artificial insemin insemination, oftentimes across species, in vitro fertilization, embryo transfer, all of these things are, are, are part of that armory, but also actually maintaining um, vessels of genetic diversity that's, that have been lost uh, in modern populations through this kind of an approach. 
So we can use reproductive technology, we can use um, cell technology, and we can use population genetics in harmony, that's the idea at least, to, um, to, to maintain these damaged um, systems that we're trying to, uh, to, to, to keep going. And there are some good examples of how that's been done. For example, um, long-term cryopreserved sperm have been used very recently in the black-footed ferret, one of the most endangered species in the United States, um, to recover genetic diversity um, 20 years after those sperm were collected in a population that had lost its genetic diversity through founder event and genetic drift in captivity subsequently. So this is, these are sperm from the past come in to, 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 to effectively um, reinvigorate the population in the present. And that's where cryopreservation could potentially uh, um, can, can, can help. Um, you know, so these, these, these are, these, this is the black water ferret, this is the, the clouded leopard. There are examples, rather few, but some examples of where this is being applied uh, in a, in a uh, transformative manner. And we are, of course, in the, as, as I said earlier, we're in this, this, this era of mass extinction, and, and um, the northern black rhino is the latest poster child for that. Um, Sudan having died last week, I'm sure you, you all heard about that, the last living male. Um, he, there's a lot, there's, there are potentially reproductive technological um, uh, solutions to this. You may even have seen some articles on the news about um, Thomas Hildebrand's um, laboratory in, in, at the Leibniz Institute in Berlin where they are trying to do um, in vitro fertilization and also um, other forms of reproductive technology to rescue this, um, this population. Um, there's also discussion, some quite mature discussion in the literature about potentially using southern white rhinos um, to, uh, to rescue this population as well. Uh, and the concept of hybrid rescue, in other words, when you go down to such a small number of individuals that you actually have no, um, you know, no real uh, um, alternative but to uh, bring in and make these, these individuals with uh, another subspecies, um, has been gaining traction over the years. And it may be even in this situation that the, uh, eventually the northern white rhino will go extinct, and I, I think that's probably the most likely outcome, unfortunately. Um, but if it is, it may be replaced by a population of southern white rhinos once the, the current poaching epidemic has been brought under control. Um, so the frozen ark then, finally, that's a long time to before actually getting to the point. Um, the frozen ark really was the brainchild of uh, Brian Clark, um, at, but he, he, and he established it with his wife Anne Clark and Anne McLaren uh, back in 2004. It was really as a result of the, his experiences with Parchula, the whole uh, genus that he was working on. Um, and you probably know this story, but I'll quickly uh, mention it. So this is a classic example of an animal that, uh, or a group of animals that live on small islands in the South Pacific. Um, they were of little concern to the local uh, economy and the local population. But at some stage, um, people were starting to ask the question that given the topology and the, um, the, the geographical isolation of these islands, whether or not there wasn't a way of bringing in a self-sustaining food source at the local um, people could eat that would be um, uh, uh, a potentially renewable resource. And so they decided that they would bring in the, the giant African land snail onto, uh, onto a number of these, these islands um, in Tahiti, in the, in those, the society islands. Um, and uh, it was a bit of a misguided introduction. What actually happened was that, as is often the case, this is an, a, a, um, a large... Um, animal from a, from a large continent, basically the giant African land sc um, snail had no competitors, grew unabated, and there are some wonderful photos actually of, of, of snails everywhere um, across the island. At one point it looked like you couldn't actually move uh, for, for snail shells. Um, and so they got to a pest stage, to an epidemic status. Um, and, um, and so the, 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 the control agent people got involved and they said, oh, we know what to do here. We need to introduce a carnivorous snail that will remove the giant African land snail. Um, and here is an exa a classic example, the rosy wolf snail from, um, from the Florida Peninsula, which is a, um, uh, a snail, eating snail, Euglandina rosea, 
uh, and we'll introduce that and that will get rid of the, the giant African land snail um, uh, epidemic. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work that way. And the, the, the Euglandina um, did, to be fair, uh, sometimes attack the giant African land snail, but it didn't control the population and instead showed a marked preference for the local endemic snails, which it finished off at a, at a, at a massive rate of knots. And um, Brian was faced with the rather sort of agonising choice about whether to leave that situation as it was or just rescue everything he could, and that's what they did. And they started a captive breeding programme, um, but also um, realised that there were some of these populations and some of these species that uh, they would not be able to rescue. And, and at this point he realised, well, we're going to lose all of this wonderful evolutionary diversity, the partula group, are a classic example of an adaptive radiation. Some of these populations are simply uh, isolated genetically by the chirality of their, their shells, um, and they have microevolutionary differentiation. They're a wonderful model species. They have been a wonderful model species for understanding the, demo the, the, um, the process of adaptive radiation, and um, they were all going to be lost. And so he, this is when he got the idea of the frozen arc, um, and um, the, 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 the actual problem and the, the devastation happened decades before, but the ARC was finally launched in 2004 um, and, uh, by, by Brian Ann and Anna and McLaren um, and uh, has been in existence ever since. And I came onto the Board of Trustees back in 2008 um, and, uh, and I've been involved with it ever since. And so, no, now we have... Uh, a lot of captive breeding, and there has been some reintroductions and in places where Euglandia can, Euglandina can be controlled, populations have re-established themselves. Uh, whether, you know, what the long-term prognosis is is another um, issue, but at least um, uh, captive breeding has, has definitely and definitively saved many of these different populations. So what are we interested in, in doing within the context of the ARC then? Well, um, so... Uh, the first major vision is, is, to, is to maintain, safeguard and utilise the genetic material of endangered animal species for the conservation and benefit of future generations. Um, and and I, you know, I, I think the most important thing to say here is that it's not simply about preservation, um, it is also about utilisation. And so um, that's one, something that I'll, I'll return to. So, um, and, and so basically what we do is we try to coordinate this whole process, I'm not going to read it out, um, but, we, but our major role is to, is, to, is to carry out research, provide infrastructure, and coordinate the whole process, um, because it has been very fragmented over, over, the, over the years. A whole bunch of different aims that we've got, um, improving methods particularly, um, which are which are very um, uh, diverse, but also very species and group specific. So we have research ongoing about um, optimizing sampling, uh, cryopreservation, um, and uh, uh, provision of samples, and uh, and and all all of the the ways in which you do that, both in terms of um, the basic science, but also the uh, the governance and and the way that's actually managed. We uh, obviously are aiming to help um, uh, facilitate and promote the conservation of all this material, um, tissue cells, DNA, um, and we're obviously there to, to pr provide the, the safety net, the backup, um, and, and we, uh, we make ourselves available. I quite often find myself san signing um, letters of support for grant applications, um, and, um, and so our idea is to help science oftentimes people want to so somebody wrote to me the other a few months ago saying I, I i would like some rna and i need it from an elephant spleen um, and now of course that might be an impossible thing for uh, uh from from if you were to try to do that on your own but as an organization like like us what we can do is we can say to our partners and we have partners all over the world next time you, you're euthanizing an elephant please you know, this is what you need to do. And so that, that's what we're trying to, to make sure that we're able to do that to help uh, scientific research and also, um, and also obviously uh, uh, conservation. So um, 
one of the things that hasn't happened in the past is that it, this stuff has all been properly databased and managed and we're, we're, we're implementing that at the moment. And also we have a big, big educational uh, role to fulfill as well. Adding another voice to the conservation community, but also adding a new, a new de development. One of the things that, that we're constantly being asked about, as you might imagine, when it comes to prior preservation of genetic material and tissue, is about de-extinction. Um, those of you who are aware of the de-extinction um, uh, sort of idea um, know that there needs to be some, some cautionary notes and voices talking about that, and that's one of the things I spend a lot of time doing as well. Um, there are lots of other uh, of these facilities, but they're disconnected. Um, and some of them have a very different uh, raison d'etre, and they even have a different philosophy. So the Svalbard Global, Global Seed Vault is a, a classic example of a, a one-off repository that's been placed, that a huge amount of investment's gone into, it's been placed geolocated in an area which they think it's impossible for it to be damaged um, and it contains basically accessions of every major food crop um, that, that, that exists on the planet. It's, and and it, its basic idea originally was very much as a repository but it's found itself um, in the centre of several um, interesting developing stories, one of which for example is around um, reuse of some of the seeds that, that are there um, for, um, uh, for very arid adapted chickpea varieties in Syria. So uh, you may or may not know but there's a, there's a strong uh, um, hypothesis out there now that the Syrian civil war was largely driven by climate change, that people came out of the, the countryside um, because they had to, because it, the, the environment had become so hot and xeric. Um, and that, that, that demographic change and movement of people sparked the war. But what, one of the other things that happened is that several chickpea um, populations that have adapted to really, really dry land habitat were, were eradicated um, during the war. And so the Syrians have already gone back to the, the, the sea um, vault to request to withdraw some of that um, germplasm so they can re-establish some of those populations. Um, and that's an example, really, of, of the sort of use and reuse and, and uh, management that needs to be um, taken into account. There are other endangered species, or there are other animal species, uh, frozen uh, arcs out there, the frozen zoo at San Diego, who are co uh, collaborators of ours and, and many others, um, especially in the United States, uh, exist. Um, but they are predominantly single institutional and, and um, they operate in isolation. Um, so, they, you know, as I say, there are some really uh, classic examples. The most recent one, actually, that's not up here is the China National Gene Bank, which um, is built into the, the side of a mountain in Shenzhen. Looks like something out of James Bond. And basically, they've got incredible um, freezing facilities uh, in, in, this, this, in this building, but also massive genome sequencing and resequencing facilities as well. So they're basically not only maintaining everything, they're sequencing everything at the same time. Um, so they've got massive, massive um, uh, uh, facilities to do that. So I want to make the point, actually, about utilisation. Because, uh, again, I, I mean, this is, this is some, a place where I probably philosophically depart slightly from my predecessors in the Frozen Ark, which is that I think, um, you know, they're, they're, the, the original philosophy of the frozen art was that we maintain these things um, for humanity for m hundreds of years to come. And of course, that's very important. But I think the one thing that uh, my sort of 30 odd years working in conservation has taught me is that if you don't actually actively utilize uh, resources, they will eventually atrophy. It's almost inevitable, especially when there's relatively small amounts of resources available in conservation. So. Um, there, there are two main, main ways in which I think it's the, 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 the frozen arc really can make a difference now. The first one is in conservation generally, but conservation breeding programs specifically. So if we are able to maintain and hold um, samples of founding populations of endangered species, um, just like with the... Um, the, the, uh, the The, the example I showed before of, of the uh, black-footed ferret, sorry, my brain's going, the black-footed ferret, where we can use that material 
uh, later on to reinvigorate the genetic diversity, as long as we're able to characterize that genetic variation, we can then uh, use, use um, the material that we've got to actively play into conservation programs. Uh, and whether that's by conserving and genotyping individuals that are living, or their sperm, or whatever, that's a really strong point, I think. The other thing we can do um, is provide material either for sequencing or for any other kind of scientific activity so people can do comparative biological studies. And that's what we're doing uh, more and more of um, and, and trying to facilitate as far as possible. Everything from developmental biology all the way through to um, medical, straight medical applications where people are interested in the evolution of gene sequences and regulatory sequences across the primates for genes that are extremely important in human disease, or um, um, you know, uh, many other uh, uh, sort of potential um, applications, we're really, really keen to facilitate that. And, and the biggest problem around that is, that, is access. So, so people don't know that the material exists. Um, if it does exist, they don't know how to apply for it, and they're certainly not aware of their obligations in terms of reporting once they've used it. And so one of the things we're trying to do is put a framework around that and make sure it's re people really understand what's out there, what they need to do to get it, uh, and what their obligations are once they've used it. Um, and that's really, really important. Of course, there are some uh, stem cell technologies uh, are, are, are also a, a potential and real potential uh, application, um, although um, not really... Um, actually happening at the moment and de-extinction of course is as I say something which we can talk about um, but I spend most of my time debunking uh, de-extinction uh, notions rather than actually um, rather than actually uh, uh, adding to them. The one thing that I have talked about and we, we, we think about a little bit is especially with museum specimens if we are able to resequence the genomes which we are now able to resequence the genomes of populations of endangered species that have now gone extinct, um, then we understand at a, gene, at a single nucleotide level what polymorphisms have been lost. Um, in, and with annotated genomes, we can understand the functional significance of those polymorphisms. Then we understand enough po potentially to re-edit that polymorphism back into that population. Um, uh, of course, the reality of making that happen is something that, that is, is some way off, and there are some real ethical issues around it. But understanding genetic diversity. And, and people talk about even more, um, I suppose, radical ideas, like if we ever get to the stage of understanding at the genomic scale what allows populations to adapt to climate change, could we edit that into, into populations of endangered species when we know that we don't have the option to move those populations into more climatically suitable envelopes? Whether that ever becomes a reality or not is another, is another issue. So, um, a lot of these endangered species and a lot of, and a lot of organisations um, have a very, very strong role to play. We have a very close relationship with EASA, the Europe European Association of Zoos and Aquaria, um, where uh, continually now samples are, being are potentially there for collection. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing is liaising very closely with the zoo um, uh, community um, to make sure that when animals are being anaesthetised or, dare I say, euthanised, that the material that's being produced um, you know, is, is collected and that people know in advance when that happens. And, and so we need to link our database with their database so that when a, a vet has got a, 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 you know, a tiger or a tarsier on, on, on the operating table that a, a flag comes up and says there's a scientific request for this particular tissue from that particular uh, organism and that can actually be all worked out in advance so that we don't waste this um, these precious resources and these poor uh, animals that are in, 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 captiv in captivity. Um, and, and of course, especially for tissue culture and, and, for, uh, and for RNA seq and those sorts of things, we really need to act fast and it's got to be really well planned. But it's doable, it really is doable. So there are biobanking hubs now. The ARS has got its own biobank at Antwerp, Copenhagen, and Scotland, and we will be working very closely with the Scottish. Um, a biobanking hub in the future. But the other thing is the samples that have been, the amount of money that must have been spent to collect the samples 
that we find in the university freezers all over the UK and Europe beggars belief. If we, if, we, you know, we, if we accept that the vast majority of the cost is time, uh, personnel costs and, and a little bit of travel, then you, know, you really are in a situation where we know that we're sitting on an absolute gold mine. The problem is uh, that a lot of that gold mine is really, really inadequately um, uh, documented. It's a bit like, I mean, I, yeah, it's a, it's a rather fatuous um, uh, comparison, but I think about it as, as gore, uh, smorgs uh, uh, treasure in, under the, in, the, in the mountain in Lord of the Rings, where, you, where, you, where there's this just enormous resource, but we don't know what it is. And you're looking for the one Arkenstone stone in the middle of that, and you may, you may find it, you may never find it. But the point is, it's poorly documented. We've all got daggy old uh, handwritten, or, or even, if we're lucky, well, well curated Excel spreadsheets. The point is that the um, the, the level of, of, of recording, how that changes over time. Lord knows in our own lab, you know, we're constantly having fits of throwing stuff out, moving stuff around. So you don't know exactly where your samples are sometimes, and you don't know how much of it you've got left. So, and yet, yet many of these samples are absolutely irreplaceable. And they are from, and many of the samples that I collected when I first started using uh, doing genetics of endangered species, many of those populations, they don't exist anymore. So those are resources that literally have disappeared and we have a real responsibility to maintain them. So universities are perhaps the biggest culprits um, because single PIs are the people that are responsible for managing this very, very important material. Museums, of course, have got their act together far better than the whole rest of the, the community and, and I also include Herbaria in that and they're, they're, they're great. And they've also got the most developed um, access and, and benefit sharing um, protocols as well. But universities really are a bit anarchic, um, and 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 uh, and you know it's it's a big ask. And also, you know, people feel very very um, attached to their samples, and that they they have the intellectual property. They went out, they got the grant, they did the field collection. Why should they give any of that material to the rest of of the of the community? Um, so we are basically working in, in, a, in a variety of different areas. We've got partnerships with a whole variety of different organisations, which, which have been very, very um, fruitful uh, over the years. From the, the big um, uh, uh, frozen arcs like the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany, um, which is the cryobrain system, and, and the uh, San Diego um, frozen zoo, the National Zoological Gardens of South Africa, and a whole bunch of different frozen zoos. We, we all have partnerships, we're partners with them, and, um, and that potentially allows us to facilitate moving of samples that might be otherwise actually not available to, to people. Um, we're, we are doing our own research, obviously. Um, we currently have research programs going on on uh, DNA degradation. Well, how, and how quickly and under what circumstances does DNA degrade? both outside of the, the freezer and inside the freezer. What happens when a freezer breaks down? What happens when you freeze thaw? How rapidly does the DNA degrade? And for what applications, for example? You know, are they still good enough for PCR? Are they good enough to make libraries for next generation sequencing? At what point do we find that we're in a situation of no return there? And can we use things like um, a classic sort of uh, um, enzyme-based rolling surface uh, re replication to actually carry out um, DNA rescue when we got down to the last dregs and, 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 and what does that do to the quality of the data. So we're working on that at the moment, we've got two students working on that who sat in the, 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 the lecture theatre here um, and we'll be starting a lot more of that in the near future. We've constructed a database um, that we are now rolling out right across the, the frozen arc called Specify. It's a, an open source database, but it's really very good indeed. Um, and uh, we, we're, we, I went over to South Africa last summer and um, got a good idea of what it, what it, how it was performing. And we've now collaborated directly with the people that make Specify um, and, uh, and are using that uh, as, a, as, a, as a really good tool for uh, making a, a global database with all sorts of um, uh, sub-databases that people can specify within them.
So yeah, so as I said before, Andy and Laurie working uh, deliberately degrading DNA, which is, seems like a real shame, but somebody's got to do it, um, and trying to see what happens to the, to the material, how quickly it all goes wrong, and trying to use them. We have lots of really nice um, collaboration from people within the school, giving us, giving us um, uh, access to incubators and, and liquid nitrogen and things, which has been really, really gratefully received. Um, we have a, a large uh, collection already in, in the ARC, um, and the Federated collection's got over 50,000 now um, specimens in it, um, and they're spread throughout the, the globe, and we try to spread the risk by making those, those, um, those samples, um, position them across different collections. Um, we have challenges, of course. Um, a lot of the time, the taxonomy of the samples that we're working with is uncertain. Um, we have to make sure that the material arrives in good condition, um, and we need to understand what, what we need to, to sample yet. In fact, we're undergoing an audit at the moment, so we can start prioritizing sampling um, on the basis of taxonomic um, diversity, but also on the basis of demand, to be honest, as well. Um, and of course, you know, we we'll have to maintain the, the, the whole um, system for research. The biggest issue that we're facing is something called the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, I don't know whether you're aware of it. Um, it's very important. It's a, a worldwide um, a, a set of legislation based around the Convention on Biological Diversity and effectively means um, it came, into, it came into, for, into force in October 2014 and it means that any material that you ship from one from where any blue country, really, uh, to your country, has to come with a Nagoya compliance material transfer agreement. A lot of people are not aware of that, um, but it's very important because if we are importing material, even if that country doesn't have the infrastructure necessarily to police or, or, or to even produce the material transfer requirements, it's the importing country that is legally obliged to make sure that that MTA is, is Nagoya compliant. Um, and uh, um, this is something that they, we spend a lot of our time trying to sort this out. It's an, an additional layer of bureaucracy above and beyond CITES and above and beyond normal animal health regulations. Um, and it's becoming a real, it's becoming a real block, block and a classic example of the law of unintended consequences. It was put in place to prevent biopiracy. It's now really affecting conservation research. So, uh, what we're trying to do is to continue to support global efforts on, on, on all of these areas, um, you know, tr try and uh, uh, collect more samples, continue and expand our research into new methods of sample preservation, <coughs> educate the public about genetics and conservation. Um, we are, uh, you know, now deep into the process of of expanding our database and making sure it's much more fit for purpose and that it will be publicly searchable on the, <coughs> the Frozen Art website. <coughs> um, we're increasing the number of partners that we're bringing on board and starting to train people as well. Um, and as I say, we're, fi we're filling in sample gaps, we're helping with grant applications and, and we're applying for work uh, for grants ourselves, obviously. Um, we've done quite a lot of work so far, um, we, we've published quite a few papers, um, we've had a number of help, helped to, to raise finances and participated in a number of collecting expeditions, snails here they are again, this time in Vietnam, um, but we're also trying to, to, um, to, to guide the, 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 the whole protocol and approach to collecting genetic di diversity and genomic diversity. So we have our infrastructure at Nottingham University. Um, we, we've been really lucky to have the su support of museums. Uh, we only have a few samples at Nottingham, but in total we've got 48,000 across the whole frozen art, belonging to 5,000 species. And we've started cataloguing um, those samples in, in, in other collections where they're, where they're not properly catalogued. Um, and, and we are doing quite a lot of outreach. And yesterday we were really pleased to hear that the BBSRC are going to fund um, our, the establishment of a new initiative called CryoArcs, uh, which involves ourselves, Nottingham University, the Natural History Museum, the National Museum of Scotland, Edinburgh University in Edinburgh Zoo, which is the ARSA mode, to take this process to a new level for the next three years. So um, that's quite good. <coughs> 
Um, we have lots of potential opportunities out there for students to work in different aspects of the arc, um, whether that be simple lab um, uh, 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 research or whether it would be it is helping other collections. So Josie, who sat in the audience here, um, took her GW for what's it called? What's it? What's sorry? Secondment. She had a, so she had a, a special GW for secondment for, for three months last year in the summer of last year, working for the Zoological Society of London, sorting out their whole samples database, re-cataloging all of their samples and, 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 and basically putting that uh, back together. Um, so we have lots of those sorts of things um, and, um, and, and we, we, we spend a lot of time helping and supporting and that will only increase over the next three years under the new CryoArts programme where we will be um, doing a lot of visits to different uh, organisations that need this kind of help. So how you can help, uh, you can act as an advocate for genetic diversity, um, you can do all of these things, you can come and do a research project with us, that would be really um, something that we would, we're, we're looking for more and more of. Um, and, and yeah, there are many different ways that you can, you can help the Frozen Ark to, to grow and, and become more relevant. Um, these are the people who are working with us at the moment. So uh, Mafalda, who um, is our, um, our, our scientific officer. Um, uh, Josie, who worked with us, has worked with us during, during her GW4 PhD. Anna, who is our graphic designer, but has also just got a PhD in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences. Uh, and Laurie and Andy, who are working in the lab at the moment as a professional training year. They're actually Bath University students. Um, and so they're, they're doing their pre PTYs with us. Um, and, and these are all of the people that have, uh, have, helped, uh, have helped us over the years. Um, it, it's part of a, a developing story, but Anne, um, who is still um, active and, and helping and providing us with uh, advice and guidance. Jude, who runs the office in Nottingham uh, particularly, um, but we have a whole board of trustees who are also very helpful, uh, an advisory board, and, and so we're, we're making progress slowly. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Happy to take any questions.